Thank you so much for listening to Enrichment Radio, www.enrichmentradio.com, home of the one new man. So here we go. We're going to start with Genesis 1, and in less than hopefully 50 minutes, we're going to get through this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God spoke and said, let there be light, and he saw that the light was good. The light now representing good, he divided light from the darkness, declaring a separation between what is good and what is evil. God completed his creation of the earth and its inhabitants in six literal days, including the sun, moon, and stars. He created all life on the ground, in the ocean, and that which is in the open firmament above. He created all things, each after its own kind, emphasizing that God is meticulous about things being separated into their own kind. With the instruction, be fruitful and multiply, God created man in his own image and had given him dominion over all living things on the earth. Then God rested on the seventh day. He sanctified it as holy for mankind to keep and preserve. God created woman out of the rib of man to become a helpmate that is bone of his bone, and the two shall be called one flesh. The serpent chastised, enticed, and seduced the woman to eat of the fruit of the mist of the garden in which God instructed Adam not to eat. The woman then gave to her husband Adam, and he ate as well, bringing down a curse upon all the earth and placing ongoing hostility between the seed of the serpent, the evil one, and the seed of Adam, the godly one. Also, permanently banishing the man, woman, and beast from the Garden of Eden, keeping them away from the tree of life, lest they eat of it and live forever. Instead, they were driven out into their cursed life of sweat, toil, and pain, never to return back to the garden. Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain, who tilled the land, and Abel, who was a keeper of sheep. Until Cain rose up one day and killed his brother Abel. Cain was clearly filled with hostility, as God had declared to exist, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of Adam, making it possible that Cain was indeed the seed of his father, the devil, while Abel was actually the true seed of Adam. Cain was therefore banished from that land out of the presence of God into the land of Nod where he married and had children. Adam and Eve then had another son named Seth, whose genealogy we follow down to Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who 2,000 years after creation are the last remaining human beings of pure genealogy from the line of Adam, living amongst a wicked and perverse generation made up of fallen angelic beings and the half-breed children they had produced with the daughters of men. This mixture of DNA spread all over the world, producing a perverse new genealogy, the mighty men of renown and giants we know as the Nephilim, an abomination whose thoughts were only evil continuously, God was grieved in his heart for making man on the earth, but Noah found grace in the sight of God because his pure genealogy from the line of Adam and because he walked with God. Noah built an ark that God instructed him to build and then filled it with two of every kind, once again, the meticulousness of God, of creature in which God had made. Noah boarded the ark with his wife and three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who brought wives for themselves Before the Lord God flooded the entire world over a period of 40 days, blotting out every living thing upon the earth. After the flood, God blessed Noah and his sons and said, Be fruitful and multiply, once again restoring and giving man dominion over all living things on the earth and reestablishing his covenant with man, making his bow to arc across the sky as a reminder of this new covenant. Noah began farming and blessed his sons, except for Ham, who embarrassed his naked, drunken father Noah one afternoon. All right, well, that basically sums up Genesis yeah. chapters 1 through 9. I know that was a lot of information, but, <laughs> but there, there's a lot of detailed stuff in there that you need to observe. Well, hopefully, if, if nothing else, oh. it will give you reason and cause to go back in Genesis, read Genesis 1 through 9 for yourself, and find out some of these amazing things that we discovered in Genesis 9. And now it brings us, Cody, to Genesis 10. Now... Let me just be honest with you guys, getting into Genesis 10, the first time I read through it, to me, it was just a bunch of names, a bunch of, uh, you know, Sheba gave birth to Heba and Beba and, and Justin Beba and, you know, on and on and on. But there's more to it than that. Genesis 10 is going to tell us exactly where we came from. So, are you guys ready for this? Let's get ready. Let's do this. Now, these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth the sons of Noah, and sons were born to them after the flood. So we're talking about Noah's sons 
Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who brought wives uh-huh. on board the ark. And now we're getting into the sons of them, of Noah's sons. We're going to start in Genesis uh, chapter 10, verse 2, with the sons of Japheth. Now we look at Japheth. Japheth is actually known as the father of the Caucasoid, or the Caucasian race, or the Indo-Europoid, the Indo-European race, the Indo-Germanic race, or the Indo-Aryan race, the Japhethites, the the Japhetic people, it's a hard one to, to pronounce, are in general the people of Europe, and Japheth is what has now modern Caucasian. And in that time, they, they, they were building up their culture at this time. Right. And then they were forming a clan or a people group. That's right. That's right. We see that with the sons of Noah, uh, beginning with Japheth that we're talking about, we see the formation of the tribes, and which is going to later become, uh, as we see here, the table of nations. And so uh, this is what we're talking about right now. So with Japheth, the, it now talks about uh, Japheth's sons. The two most important ones, the ones it talks about the most, are Gomer and Magog, and there's a reason why. But the sons of Japheth, uh, in verse 2, were Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech and Tyres. Verse 3, the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Ripheth and Togorma. Now, the whole modern Celtic race, I did some research, the whole modern Celtic race has been regarded as descended, being descendants, from a blending of the tribes of Gomer and Magog. Now, while the Welsh Celts claim to be descendants of Gomer exclusively, the Irish Celts claim to be descendants of Magog. Now, it's believed that they freely mingled and intermixed uh, with their, their tribes, uh, cultures together, according to some Irish chronicles. Uh, living geographically in Eastern Europe, Southern Russia, and Asia Minor, they were referred to by the Greeks as the Kelto Skyve. And as we can see here, these, these tribes were intermingling together. They started to. And they were forming different religions and different components. That's a very important thing to, to understand. And we, and we need to know that we, we, we generated from these. We generated from these. Right, right, that's right. Uh, one of the things after the flood, when tribes started to form, obviously the same thing started to stir up again that caused the flood to begin with. And we're going to get to that in, a, in just a little bit also in chapter 10. Uh, but as we discussed, uh, the Celtics, uh, Irish and Welsh Celtics, it's important to know, the early Celtic tribes from Gomer settled much of Europe, including present-day uh, Spain, France, England, Germany. Uh, all this was prior to the Scythians, which the Scythians were known as the blending of the uh, Gomer and the Magog tribes, the Celtic tribes. Ooh. Now, what's interesting, mm-hmm. right, is that the Welsh mm-hmm. uh, from Gomer, uh, the tribe of Gomer, the Welsh Celtics call their language Gomeridge, still to this day. It's still an intact yeah. language uh, called Gomeridge, which was after yeah. Gomer. So we can see that there's even languages that are still spoken that are intact today that stretch all the way back to Gomer. And Gomer was a world leader, actually, and, mm-hmm. and, and to a effect that, that he built his own tradition and the language that when they heard him, it was very distinct. Right. Well, you have to, in order to be able to form your own language, you have to have some kind of a wealth of power and leadership. And so, yes, it's obvious that Gomer uh, was indeed a leader uh, or a ruler of of some kind in that area. An influential... An influential person. Mm -hmm. Or or figure. Mm -hmm. Figure. Because you need an influential figure to get information out of. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that you can build up your vocabulary like we do in Hebrew, mm-hmm. the Messianic. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. So now we're still on the sons of Japheth. We're talking about the uh, Japhetites, uh, who uh, evidently uh, we come from as the Caucasian. Most Caucasians, European, Celtics come from the tribe of Japheth. Uh, another son is Javan. 
where Elisha, and this is now Genesis chapter 10, verse 4, Javan, where Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dadanim. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, every one according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. These were the maritime peoples that we also see from the tribe of Japheth. The maritime people were those who established the coastline nations. Uh, they made trade routes for the generations to come. Now, historical evidence strongly suggests the first inhabitants of the British Isle were from uh, the tribe of of Japheth were actually from descendants of Javan. His sons, Elisha and Tarshish, traded with wealth of silver, iron, tin, and lead. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 12. And the rabbis say that they built fortified cities. On the coast, uh, on the, the coastlines? Coast mm -hmm. Because they were very pioneer-like mm -hmm. in their in their faith or tradition mm -hmm. that when they did something, they build it out of out of the blueprint they had. Right, right. What's interesting to note, guys, is that these tribes and these people were very intelligent. They were highly intelligent, uh, building great walls. I mean, come on, making up the trade routes for trade and wealth. These, this right now blows away, and, and as far as I'm concerned, it blows away the uh, uh, straight line thinking, point A to point B evolution theory that we crawled up out of a, a gutter pool of, of slime, uh, became monkeys, and then turned into man, okay? These were highly intelligent. And, the, and then the political factor, they, they, were, they were actually making the economic system. They made the economic system, that's right. And, and, and very they, rapidly, too. And, and, they had, and they had to do it with subculture mentality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now we're going we're gonna to break away. For sake of time, we're going to break away from the sons of Japheth, yep. which now we've identified the sons of Japheth as being the uh, Caucasian primarily uh, tribe. Now we're going to get into verse 6. Genesis chapter 10, verse 6 talks about the sons of Ham. Now we already noted that Ham did not find favor with his dad because Ham found him in an embarrassing, naked, drunken state. And so Noah blessed both Shem and Japheth, uh, but said that Ham is going to be the servant of both of them. But let's look at what the Bible talks about the sons of Ham and his descendants. You want to know the, the, the meaning of Ham? What's the meaning of Ham? The, the name the meaning is dusky. It, it means to be on fire or to be black. To be black or to be dark. Dark. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so as we see, this is where the African-American culture is going to originate. Well, it's interesting because I, we looked up the sons of Ham and we actually indeed did find out that Ham, uh, the, uh, Ham is, through his genealogy, can be traced back to be the father of the Mongoloid and the Negroid races, and the also known as the Hamites. Mm -hmm. Now, the sons of Ham, uh, b starting again in verse 6, the sons wow. of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush, we're going to focus around Cush. Cush is one of, of, of Ham's uh, sons. The sons of Cush were Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Ramah and Septica. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Now, from these people, the descendants of Cush, we get the Nubians, Ethiopians, mm -hmm. Sadani, Sudanese, uh, Ghanaians, and the Africans. Uh, and you also get the Egyptians. And you also get the Egyptians. Excellent point. That's right. And because some mixtures of the Egyptians are black and some are in their natural form, like Caucasian. They're, some are... Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, Cush became the father of Nimrod. Nimrod became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it was said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, let's talk about Nimrod because... Oh, this boy. Genesis chapter 10, starting here in verse 10, has a lot to say about Nimrod, and it's going to speak volumes about uh, what was going on at that time. Verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom, talking about Nimrod, was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalneh, in the land of Shinar, 
From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehoboth, Ir, and mm -hmm. Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. Wow. Okay, so who was Nimrod? Well, here's what I discovered. It comes from the Hebrew verb marad. Nimrod does. It comes from the Hebrew verb marad, meaning rebel or revolt. Okay? Now, it's more likely a derisive term of re a rebellion against creator, against the creator, the one true God. So Nimrod is most likely what I discovered, not his name, but a derisive term right. that was used to uh, talk about what he did and who he was, which was a rebel. He was a rebellious person against God, the creator. Uh, and as you, as you can see in this verse, he was very isolated in his ways he, because his <clears throat> characteristic was to rebel mm -hmm. against God, but that really ruined your characteristic. Well, what's also interesting is that not only was he a, a king and built one kingdom, but this guy, this Nimrod character, established many kingdoms. I mean, at the time, this person was very, very prominent. We see that Nimrod established uh, kingdoms all over the place. This guy was stomping all over ground, making kingdoms everywhere. Now, a kingdom, in order to be a kingdom, he had to be a person who was an example for people to follow. He had to have strength, might, mm. character, wisdom, all of these things. Mm. Some scholars believe, okay, I know you're getting antsy and excited, but just <laughs> hang on, Cody. Some some scholars believe that Nimrod, okay, because the, the Bible doesn't talk a whole lot more about him, was actually Gilgamesh mm. of the Gilgamesh epic. And for those of you who haven't heard of the Gilgamesh epic, uh, Gilgamesh is described in history as part God and part man, a great builder and warrior and a wise man in the story. He's not mentioned in the Bible. And the thought is that the reason Gilgamesh is not mentioned in the Bible or in the scriptures because the author of this passage of scripture did not want to call Gilgamesh by his name and give him any honor because of what he stood for. He stood for revolt against God. But instead... He wanted to call him, the author of the scripture wanted to call him by a, a derisive name, which is meant a rebel, to revolt, Nimrod. Now, we know that Nimrod is a tyrannical opponent of the one right. true God. Right. Now, that's, that's what the word Nimrod means. Now, he was the first post-flood ruler mm -hmm. of the earth. Mm -hmm. He ruled over the earth. And if we blend the... Gilgamesh epic, along with what the Bible says, this is what we uh, find find out. He ruled over the earth to promote and indoctrinate the nations with self-courage to live without the need for worshiping God. Actually, according to the Gilgamesh epic, he brainwashed the people to believe that he could hunt down God and kill him. Now, the way the story goes in the Gilgamesh epic is that he told people that he was going to go and hunt after God and cut off his head and bring it back down. And in the Gilgamesh epic, it is believed that some people believed this tyrannical uh, liar yeah. and that he came down saying, see, look, I did kill God and I mm. still stand. And he convinced people that they would never again have to worry about another flood mm. so long as they live. But the reality is, is God has already promised that he would never flood the world again. So all this tyrannical ruler was doing was just reiterating mm. what God said, but building himself up to be like God. And as we can see, Nimrod had an independent culture going. Mm -hmm. uh, or as we can see, it's a socialism aspect because mm -hmm. socialism is all about independence. And, and That's all. right. And so Gilgamesh or Nimrod developed this socialistic attitude of, of independence, independent of worshiping God. Now, Fools at the time uh, believed that Gilgamesh or Nimrod uh, accomplished this. And again, this is from the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, but fools believed him, okay? And uh, they, fools believed he accomplished it and that they could live without the fear of the flood ever happening again. And when that didn't work, here's what else is interesting. 
uh, Nimrod or Gilgamesh would forcibly take men, hunt men, and it said that he would eat men. He was a hunter of men. It said that Gilgamesh did just as the sons of God did in Genesis chapter 6. Forcibly took men's wives and promoted violence. He also was the one to build the Tower of Babel. Uh, Isaiah 14, 13 says this, But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. This rebel opponent against God was of the devil. Uh, and he had... He had the characteristic like Cain. He had, he had the spiritual component like Cain, mm -hmm. because it it goes down through generation. Right. And we can see this is a generational curse that affects the present time in this culture. Yeah. And, yeah. And that will affect a whole bunch of people that they get radicalized. That's right. Now here's one of the questions that we have: How did this person even get here after the flood? God wiped out all Nephilim flesh, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the scriptures tell us uh, after Genesis 6. And we know that Noah and his sons were pure genealogy from the line of Adam who walked with God. So, okay, well, according to the scripture, we don't know anything about the wives of Noah's sons. Right. So we know that Noah and his sons were pure genealogy from the line of Adam. God's plan was to wipe out all Nephilim flesh. Right. Uh, from the face of the earth. Now Noah's sons brought wives with them, the wives of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But it's obvious at this point to learn now that they were not of pure genealogy. They couldn't have been. It's through the mixture, once again, that between the DNA, the line of Adam, and the line of the fallen angels, which was carried by the wives of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, now, it's through that, these lines now in these tribes that we get characters that are once again Nephilim right. in spirit, in size, in strength, and in wisdom, right. such as Nimrod or Gilgamesh. And as we see in the scripture, it's a genetically mutation. That is it's a, a DNA mutation, yeah. That is genetically modified into this culture. Right. And, and that will affect everybody mm -hmm. in its mm -hmm. path. That's right. That's right. And while Nimrod was the first ruler that we mm -hmm. see, we're going to find out later on in scriptures that there were more giants, and there were, in fact, there was tribes of giants mm -hmm. just like, uh, just like Nimrod, uh, Gilgamesh. And so we're we're going to get there. And let's continue on in verse thirteen. Mizraim became the father of Ludim, and Anamim, and Lehabim, and Nephtahim, and Pathrusim, and Caslehim from which came the Philistines and Kaphtorim and also the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. So, once again, we're still talking about the descendants of Ham. Mm -hmm. Okay? And in verse 15, Genesis chapter 10, Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Jergeshite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Zemurite, and the Hemathite, and afterward the families of the Canaanite were spread abroad. The territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon, as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza. As you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, as far as Lasha, these are the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. A lot of these tribes of Hams ended up being giants. Not only Nimrod, or uh, uh, is, is, was known as a giant. A lot of the uh, Jergeshites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, these are all uh, yeah. a lot of ites. There's over yeah. 30 of them that were known as tribes of giants. We know that we see giants later in Scripture, such as Goliath. Yeah. There were many rulers and many kings who were known as giant men, both in stature, power, and mm. wisdom, all because of the DNA line of the Nephilim. And as we can see, this is modern-day Libya, too, mm -hmm. because uh, they're both in one territory. That's right. And at the same time, as we look here, uh, they're, they're in the same territory. Right. And so, so far, we're, we're, th we're in Genesis chapter 10. We've gotten through verse 20 so far. And so far, we've talked about the tribe of Japheth, the Jephethites, which you can see in the top, that's the red, and uh, which which is the, you get the tribes of, of Gomer, of Magog, mm -hmm. a lot of the Celtic, the Irish, the Welsh, 
as well as the Indo-European uh, and Asia Minor. Basically, the Caucasian uh, uh, race of people had begun there. We've also now talked about ham. Ham, as you can see in the green, uh, has, is, is known to have produced all the tribes, which includes all of the ites, uh, if you will, in addition to uh, the line of those who are darker, uh, the Mon mongoloid, as well as the African mm -hmm. uh, cultures, all from the tribe mm -hmm. of Ham, descendants of Ham. Now, verse 21 of Genesis chapter 10, we're going to get into Shem. Now, Shem, the father of all children of Eber. Eber is also known as Heber, and that's where we get our, the term Hebrew from. Yeah. So, the sons of Shem are the Hebrews. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Arpeshad and Lud and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz and Hol and Gether and Mash. Verse 24, Arpeshad became the father of Shelah, and Shelah became the father of, of Eber. The two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, and for in his day the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almadad and Shelef and Hazar Mar Maveth and Jorah and Hadaram, and Uzo, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abamel, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Now, their settlement extended from Mesha, as you go towards Safar, the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. Verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations, and out of the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. This, everybody, is our table of yeah. nations. Yeah. This is where it all began. So we see we have the Caucasians coming from the tribes of Japheth. We have the Africans uh, coming primarily from the tribes of Ham, and we have the Hebrew uh, people coming from the tribes of Shem, the Semites. And this is where they get their Semitic language from. Where they get their Semitic language. Yeah. So it's very cool. And so now if you want to think about, you know, uh, us being a uh, father Abraham, I've got to tell you right now that me and Cody are yeah. not uh, sons of father Abraham. Uh -huh. Why? Because we actually are from the tribe of Japheth, right? Now, right. if you live in Jerusalem and Israel, then yes, you are a father Abraham. So that yeah. song that goes, father yeah. Abraham <laughs> had many sons. Uh, Many sons, sons had Father Abraham. Abraham. Well, I'm going to change that song right now. It's going to go like this. Ready? Father, Father Jeff Fifth had many descendants. Many descendants had Father Jeff Fifth. I'm a Jephthahite, and so, so were you. So, so let's, let's all praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Woo! -hoo! All right. So, anyways, that was our silly little song we had to uh -huh. throw in there, being of the Jephite. So now, we're going to try and squeeze in, in the last bit of time that we have left, chapter 11, because it fits nicely with chapter 10, okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about, and now, let me stop right there just to reiterate, we know that uh, languages were somewhat different, however they were able to communicate, that's basically what we're seeing here in Genesis 11, is that the whole earth had a lot of common words that they were able to understand, in order to accomplish things, okay? Uh, now we know this, that the maritime people of the tribe of, of Japheth uh, obviously built a lot of trade up and down all the, the coasts, right. and so they had to be able to communicate with everybody in order to get that trade going. And this is an act of universal language that they right. had. And, so, and what's interesting yeah. is we're getting back to that point where once again in this society, we more or less are coming to a universal language. In fact... I believe we do have a universal oh. language, Cody, right? Oh. I mean, well, most, most everybody knows how to speak English, right? I mean, most everybody in the world. But it's soon they will be speaking Hebrew. Wow. Well, so verse, chapter 11, verse 2, it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Verse 3, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower, whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This happened in Babylon under the ruler of Nimrod, or Gilgamesh, as historians say. 
You know what now, I see here? What do you see here, brother? Uh, I see that Nimrod is building his first government. Yeah, well, he's trying to build more than that. Yeah. Nimrod, or through Babylon, is trying to, as he said, and as was pointed out earlier, he's trying to raise his throne yeah. high up above yeah. gods. That's what he is yeah. trying to do. He he's wants to reach for the stars. He's trying to be superior, but but there's no <clears throat> other superior god than the one true god. And we're going to prove that yeah. right yeah. now. Are you ready for this? This is where it yeah. gets good, and this is why we serve an awesome god, yeah. and I'm excited. So... <laughs> Chapter 11 of Genesis, verse 5. The Lord came down. He came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. He looked around and said, oh, that's cute. Oh, I bet he wasn't amused. That's cute, guys. Oh, look at your little building. Oh. No, that's not, that's, not what ha that's not what he said, but this is what did happen. The Lord came down to see the city and tower which the sons of men had built. The actual account of a face-off between Nimrod and the one true God. That's what I believe Ooh. really happened right here. God came down to check out this city that was being built, to check out this tower, and Ooh. have a face-off with Nimrod. Ooh, so I... Nimrod, Gilgamesh, I heard you hunt me down, brother. Where are you? So here we go. So we have this face-off. And then this, in the, in the scripture, the Lord's characteristic changes, actually, into Elohim, judgment. Supreme judgment. So, Elohim has made his appearance. Oh, yeah. Now, verse 6, <laughs> the Lord said, Behold. And I love our Lord. I love oh. our God because of his composure. Oh, yeah. The Lord said, Behold. The people, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And what is, and, and this is what they began to do. Basically, God is saying they have one language. They're able to communicate, and this is what they begin to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Yeah. Verse 7, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord God scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let me tell you guys something about the power of the God that we have. You know what? Gilgamesh and Nimrod and these stupid rulers can rise up and try to build these towers. But only the power of God can come and with a spoken word make everybody all of a sudden sound like this. Because... 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 In an instant, he changed the language. He took the breath of people all abroad and made it different. Nobody can understand each other. That is a sign of a powerful, powerful, powerful God. And so he didn't even have to face off with Gilgamesh or Nimrod. He probably just looked over at him, gave him a nice wink and said, see you later, man. Uh, and he probably kickstarted their hearts. Kickstarted well. their uh, hearts as well, uh, right? Uh, if you if you trip if you were talking and all of a sudden your language, whatever came out of your mouth, was different than what you were raised mm -hmm. talking, I'm sure you would trip out uh, too. I know uh, I would, and it would change my heart. And all of a sudden, I would uh, look at Nimrod Gilgamesh, and then I would look at the one who changed my language, and I would say, uh, <laughs> "Lord uh, and God, uh, take me with you." Uh, uh, so, and, and, anyways, I can go. We can go on forever on that. Uh, and this took place within seconds. It was instantaneous. God scattered them and scattered their language abroad. Now, we are going to get, for the sake of time, we got to move on uh, because there's a lot more to talk about here in chapter 11. This is verse 10. Now, descendants of Shem. We're going to get into the Semites now, uh, the Hebrew people and Israel and, and Jerusalem. These are the records of the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and became the father of Arpashad two years after the flood. And Shem lived 500 years after he became the father of Arpashad, and he had other sons and daughters. Right now, according to our calculations, this puts us at the year 2100 B.C. Yep. We know that we were about 2000 B.C. at the time of the flood and when Noah landed from the flood and civilization began. Right. Okay, so and Shem, Noah's son... And this is where a lot really transpired. Right. Shem, Noah's son, uh, was 100 years old when he became a father. Okay, so this puts us at 2100 B.C., roughly. Now, 
uh, Shem's son Arpashad lived 35 years and became the father of Shelah. Well, now this puts us at the year 2135 BC. And Arpashad lived 403 years after he became the father of Shelah, and he had other sons and daughters. Shelah lived 30 years and became the father of Eber. Well, now that 30 years now puts us at 2170 BC, and Shelah lived 403 years after he became the father of Eber. And he had other sons and daughters, Eber being also Heber or Hebrew. Eber or Hebrew lived 34 years and became the father of Peleg. So now we are at 2204 BC. And Eber lived 430 years after he became the father of Peleg. Mm. And he had other sons and daughters as well. Peleg lived 30 years and became the father of Aru. Now, at that 30 years, we are now at 2,234 B.C. Peleg lived 209 years after he became the father of Ru, and he had other sons and daughters. Ru lived 32 years and became the father of Sarug. Now we are at 2,266 B.C. And Ru lived 200 years and 207 years, actually, after he became the father of Sarug, and he had other sons and daughters. Sarug lived... 30 years, and became the father of Nahor. So now we are at 2,296 B.C. Uh And Sarug lived 200 years after he became the father of Nahor, and he had other sons and daughters. Now Nahor lived 29 years and became the father of Terah. So now we are 2,325 B.C., and Nahor lived 119 years after becoming the father of Terah, and he had other sons and daughters. He died at at the year 2,326 B.C. Wow. Wow. Now, what's interesting, as we go back through that, and I know I went through it quickly, is that Eber, also known as Heber or Hebrew, uh, where the Hebrews come from, uh, the father of Peleg, outlived his descendants. Mm. Eber, it says, lived 430 years after Peleg was born. You can see that. He lived 430 years, right? Oh, yeah. Peleg only lived 200 years oh, from yeah. the time he was uh, birthed until the time he died. He lived 200 years. So, uh, Eber got to watch his son Peleg, they died together of old age. One was 400 years, one was 200 years. And what's interesting is that his children, Peleg's children, only lived 200 years. Mm -hmm. And by the time we get down to Nahor, he lived only 100 years. What a quick decline in lifespan. We went from 400 years, Mm -hmm. right, with um, uh, Eber, or Hebrew, Mm -hmm. down to now 100 years of man, uh, that's how many years uh, man live. So at this point, and also before you get to your thought, I just want to let it be known that at this point we estimate the earth to be uh, 2,734 B.C. And as we can see, Heber, or Heber, Hebrew, there wasn't the name Jew, it was Hebrew. It was Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Because, and this is when they modernized it as Jew. That's right, that's right. Interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. Now, these are the records of the generations of Terah. Verse 27. Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth, in Ur of Chaldeans. Abraham and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, and grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So we are now at 2,939 years B.C., just shy of the year 3,000 B.C., and already we see an awful lot of stuff. Our entire table of nations was reestablished before 3,000 B.C. And you know what's interesting? What's that? Abraham, Abram, was raised in modern-day Assyria. Oh, wow. So he's... Firmly a terrorist, but in biblical circumstances, he's the father of the faith. Very interesting. 
And that's all the time that we have for this week's Bible reading. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed it. We tried to get everybody caught up from Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 11. We'll be back next week with Genesis chapter 12. My name is Kevin. This is my good friend Cody joining yeah. me in the Enrichment Radio studio. And I thanks encourage you to... Having me. Hey, thanks for being here, man. I love having you here. And I encourage you guys to visit us at www.enrichmentradio.com. We are home of the one new man, the Jew and Gentile, back together again. And... Uh, with that, also download our free mobile app. It's available for iPhone and Android users. Keyword search, keyword search, Enrichment Radio. 24 hours a day of great music, great talk shows, uh, and also great interviews. Cody.